I'd like to talk to you about the mess that we're in with increasing complexity. First of all, is your life more complicated than it was 10 years ago? And how is that working for you? <laughs> and how is that working for all of us and our collective ability to thrive? Three facts. Number one, stress is increasing. It's gone up about 20% in the last 25 years. Two, complexity is increasing. According to IBM, we now have 2.5 quintillion bytes of data on the planet, 90% of which created in the last two years. Three, <laughs> isolation is increasing. Despite all the ways we have of connecting, and maybe research suggests in part because of those ways, we feel less connected. 2010 study by AARP found that one in three adults is chronically lonely. That's up 65% since 2000. In the same period, the New York Times reports that uh, suicide among adults has increased by 30%. We have this rising tide, and we're struggling, and it's painful. So the question is, what are the skills that we need to navigate that complexity and to stay clear about what really matters? And can we learn and teach those skills? And what would happen if a lot of people, like a billion, was actually practicing those skills? Since this is TED, we have to talk about the brain, right? <laughs> so in the increasing data, the way our brain focuses is by ignoring emotion. There have been a lot of recent neuroscience studies talking about competing neural networks. Mary Helen Imordino Yang studied the neural networks that we use to focus on external data and the networks we use to focus on internal emotion and reflection. And she found that these networks are anti correlated. In other words, we suppress one system in, to provide resources for the other. And we all do this. You're sitting at the table. You're working on your taxes, you're trying to focus, and your kid comes up to you and asks you a question, and you snap at him. Not because you're a jerk, I hope, <laughs> but because your social brain is being suppressed in order to provide the resources for your task brain to do that job. As complexity increases, the way our brain works is actually making this situation worse. So we're kind of screwed. But it's not all bad news, because we can flip that switch and re-engage that social, emotional brain so that we can reflect, and we can care, and we can connect. And we can train ourselves to do it better. And there's a huge network of people all over the world who are doing this, who are actively practicing the skills of emotional intelligence and teaching those skills to children and to adults. And those skills matter. A uh, study of a very large company, 260,000 employees, every new manager is now getting a six-month development program infused with emotional intelligence. And they are increasing their EQ scores on average 10%. Now, that might not sound like that much, but 10% is correlated with significant increases on influence and decision-making. And 60% of the people are experiencing dramatic improvements in their quality of life. Here's a study of retired NFL athletes. You can see in the lower left-hand corner, here's a guy who's really struggling. He's suffering from addiction, from failed relationships, trouble with the police, financial difficulties. And you see how steep the line is down there? What that means is that just a little increase in emotional intelligence and his life success goes up a lot. A little more increase in emotional intelligence, his life success goes up a lot, and now he's doing okay. Now, this is affecting our children as well. Here's a picture of mine a few years ago. Study of uh, parents in Singapore by Sue McNamara. 60 days, parents' EQ is going up 13%. When you read their journals, at the beginning of this project, they're interacting just like we all do. They're impatient, it's transactional, they're not really connecting with their kids. 60 days later, they're listening, they're solving problems, they're collaborating to solve things together. They're behaving just like I would really like to behave as a parent. There's now abundant data that the learnable, measurable skills of emotional intelligence drive positive change. But the question is, how do we put those skills into action? 
Here's a three-step process. One, be more aware. Know yourself. Tune in. Take those mindful moments. And then respond instead of reacting. Choose yourself. Pause. Follow your own best intentions. And then do it for a reason. Give yourself. Increase empathy and pursue noble goals. Connect with people. Connect with purpose. I'd like to double-click on this for a minute. Recent paper, Barbara Fredrickson and team studied the effects of happiness on health at a level of genetic expression. And they compared hedonic happiness, happiness from pleasure, to eudaimonic happiness, happiness from meaning. And they found that happiness from pleasure actually reduces health. But deep in our architecture, it's happiness from meaning, not happiness from fluff that makes us thrive. I mentioned this skill of pursuing noble goals, being the change. And it sounds touchy-feely, especially when you get outside of California. <laughs> but increasingly, the data is showing that this is the difference that makes the difference. Just one example. 27,000 managers in North America. The EQ competency that most differentiates middle managers from senior managers pursuing noble goals. And if you're in the top quartile, you're almost twice as likely to be a senior executive. We have this ability to find purpose and to put it into action. In the context of our daily chaos, it gets lost. The bottom line, we are living in times that are creating an increasing demand on our social and emotional capabilities. And so to thrive, we have to also increase our emotional intelligence. You want to try it right now? Yes. So <laughs> I'd like you to think of a situation where you really need to bring your EQ A game, a challenge that you're facing, a big decision you have to make, maybe a relationship that you need to repair. And while you're thinking of that, I want you to go back to this three-step model. Number one, what are you feeling? Not just the obvious feelings, but the feelings that are underneath that. Emotions are real. They're biological signals of opportunity and threat. They're messages from you to you. Read them. Step two, you have a choice. You have a choice about how you think. You have a choice about how you feel. You have a choice about how you act. What are three different ways you could respond in this situation? What are ten? And... Get off autopilot. Then step three, your choice matters. What do you want to be adding to the world? And which of those many options takes you in that direction? Move toward purpose. Now, it's a cycle. So every time you go through this process, you get more clear about where you are and where you want to be, and the shift, the response instead of reaction that will move you a little bit closer towards that positive change. We can find our way through this rising complexity and build a world that is both sustainable and worth creating. And to do so, we need to increase our emotional intelligence. But knowledge is not enough. It's not enough to just be aware. These are skills that we can develop and we can use. And so our vision is that by 2039, a billion people are practicing emotional intelligence. Yeah. Now, at that point, that'll be about one in 10 people. It's actually not that many. We can do this. And when a billion people are actively, consciously using emotional intelligence on a daily basis, it will change the world. Thank you. <laughs>